Welcome to Firestar TV. Today we are joined by Naomi Davidson. Welcome, Naomi. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do and how you help black men and women in London? And is it the UK as well? Um, I would say mainly in London, but I'm sure I've got a few people that are like graduates and around those areas that I support as well. So, um, yeah, so just to start with my credentials, so I'm a person-centred counsellor. Um, I'm also a fitness instructor, so I teach um, box fear and um, yoga, as well as being a community nutritional advisor. So just wrapping that all up, I wrap that up in, as a wellness coach. So some people have come through to me via fitness, it could be mental health um, or a combination of both. So um, I also have a strong passion for mental health and well-being. So um, I have run um, my own women's events and they're not exclusively black, but um, just by default because of my network, um, the majority of attendees are black. And with that, one of the researches that I conducted was um, with on black women in the UK's mental well-being and the challenges that they face. So I did that, I think it was um, 2017, and it started off as somebody requesting some data. And so my background is research and analysis. And so um, they requested some data or some background on black women's mental health, and then I noticed that there wasn't any information which then made me conduct my own survey and do a focus group, which went down really well. Um, yeah, really, really well. And I was like inundated with about, you know, 3.5 pay black women trying to connect practitioners, other people. So I realized it was well needed. So I've got those um, results as well. And so I'm always tapping in. And I've actually launched another one because I tried to do black men and uh, men to the well-being. The results wasn't as uh, <laughs> kind of well populated as mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. changing. So I, I, although I was able to obtain a lot of qualitative feedback, um, it's been mostly um, the number crunching has been mostly from the women. So I decided to run another one so that I think it was about three or four weeks ago we kicked off with um, another black men and black women's um, well-being kind of um, challenges survey. So I've got that. And then also I used to, um, just this year I resigned, but I used to head up the health and wellbeing for um, 100 Black Men of London charity, which is an awesome, awesome mentoring charity. And yeah, so I was responsible for coordinating their health and wellbeing events um, in the community. And as well as supporting, um, they've got a Black mental health kind of workshop event that they also run. So because I also run the practitioners network that was responsible for kind of coordinating the practitioners, the speakers yeah. and signposting mm -hmm. the story okay. So yeah. Wow, that's a lot. That is a lot. So from what you've um, studied looking at black men and black women, what sort of things have come up as challenges? So with the black women specifically, and there's lots of overlaps in um yeah, there's lots of overlaps, but there are things that are exclusive to um, both. So uh, a lot of the overlaps have been um, in terms of kind of the racism, as you know, the racism, the microaggression that they have to daily encounter, um, especially at work, um, which is going to be quite stressful and putting a lot of strain on their relationships, as well as kind of the macro racism and institutional racist um, kind of policies and agendas that they've had to endure. And then it goes more specifically then start looking at from a cultural perspective and that's when you see things such as parenting and it's not really something that we discuss but um, a lot of kind of our trauma is inherited so that from that intergenerational trauma um, coming down from parent to parent in terms of the way that we're rearing our children so a lot of it would be talking about some of the beatings that they used to receive um, and even though we might talk quite lightly and kind of you know um, lay it off a little know, bit yeah about it it's, yeah it's a serious active people and then, and then as well as that that's kind of like an extreme because some of the beatings that some of the you know like children that are now adults parents having to had to endure has been quite horrific but it's also as a, a result they talk about some of the challenges have been them the affection that they may have between their mother and their father so a lot of the women kind of was breaking down in the focus groups talking um, about you know that they never received a hug 
from their mum. They had to remember their mother or their father saying, I love you. And as we know from the studies of attachment, affection, all of those things, they will have an impact on your self-esteem going forward. So those are things that kind of cross over, um, you know, like with both. So we've got that, that kind of macro level in terms of, you know, society and the racism, as well as kind of the micro, which is going on to do with our personal well-being, how we see ourselves, our value, our worth, um, how we connect, how we communicate, um, and all of these issues that are going on at a micro level, which will impact how we deal with things, the opportunities that we go for or don't go for, you know, and that, that type of thing. And then the things that are exclusive to, I suppose, each side. So from a male point of view, a lot has been spoken about kind of that toxic um, masculinity, um, that machoism, trying to, you know, live up to this kind of male kind of ego Bravado, yeah. really understanding what that is. Mm -hmm. A lot of the black men talked about having this impression of, you know, I've got to be a strong black man, but not actually having, knowing what that is. And what, what that means. A strong mm -hmm. black man. And then how that kind of interacts with their relationships um, because then some of them are coming from, you know, like a kind of warped or, you know, like a, a, a negative viewpoint for the, the lack of understanding, which then fuels into how they relate to their partner um, and even themselves and their peers. So dealing with their own mental health. And so a lot of bits around there. And then also the pressure, the pressure. So um, one of the events that was spearheaded by the 100 Black Men of London was from a guy, Dean Williams, who spoke about being a volunteer in the 100 and then having a breakdown in his relationship and feeling that he couldn't speak to anyone and was unsupported and he said it wasn't just his mental well-being just you know like because that's one of the things that we notice actually a lot of black men the two kind of biggest triggers for their mental health or low mental health is finances loss of work and a breakdown of relationship which they may not share to shit, shame, guilt, you know, and those types of things. And then not knowing where to go in terms of picking up and rebuilding his life. Um, another brother talked about the fact that he broke down a relationship that was perfectly good just because he had lost his job and felt embarrassed to kind of, you know, talk about the financial because of, again, the impression. So we got that on the male side. And then on the woman's side, a lot of it um, has been split between... Um, one, the lack of support they receive. So the lack of the support, and it's not just on partners that they feel like, you know, the burden, have that burden to carry, because a lot of them are in single parent households, um, looking after children and receiving little support, not just financially, but, you know, in any kind of way, as well as also them talking to their elders, their mothers about some of the challenges and kind of being told that, or made to feel that what they're going through is um, kind of, you know, non-important, you know, like, you know, trivial, worse, blah, 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 what you're planning to fix up and get it, so not even, you know, they're having their feelings acknowledged of the struggle and then having to repress it, as well as having to deal with, um, again, they've got their own ideals about what a strong black woman um, is, so I always talk about an example where I had shopping bags, because I love this one, I had shopping bags and I asked the brother to help me, and then he was like, no, you got this, sis, you're strong. And I remember just thinking, wow, you know, like, it's hard enough, um, you know, that having to ask for help as a black woman, mm. you feel like, you know, you should be able to do it all. And let alone when you do, and then almost that strong woman has been used against us. Yeah. To, to mean that you should just get on with it. Do you think there's a... Do you think there's a difference between being a strong woman and a strong black woman? Are there, are there any differences? Um, when you think about the strong woman we i don't know we start thinking about like almost like superwoman so it's almost like she's all encompassing that she's working and she's doing this and she's flying and she looks happy but that that narrative is not the same as the, <laughs> the strong black woman where actually when what visually comes up is actually the back the loads and heaviness being carried as opposed to that flying through the air so i feel like that relates to kind of that whole feminist movement and this is where maybe some feminists will hate me but I just I feel that the feminist movement when it started um, and it may have changed now in its guises but wasn't for black women so when a lot of it was set up for 
you know, white middle class women who had nannies, had help, had support, and were talking about, yeah, do it all. But I didn't really think that actually the black woman's situation is slightly different. So where we then try to do it all, literally, we don't have that same support. And this is where it's leading to kind of like um, the mental health issues and also physical health. Um, so a lot of, you know, we are, we are disproportionate in terms of some of the health issues that we experience. And I do believe that is for the overburden and also the lack of um, feeling like you can be vulnerable or ask for support. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of um, what you were saying in terms of childhood trauma, do you think that that's some of the issues that have added to why some of the black men are like joining gangs and being in this street culture because they're looking for this affection and this attention that they didn't necessarily get at home, so they're looking for that on the streets? Do you think that's part of what has added to the, the gang sort of culture in London? I think most definitely most definitely and as a counsellor um one of my um biggest target um groups was um young black boys that were excluded um in the camden um kind of camden borough so they were sent to me um you know either that they're in a crew or they're on their way to a crew and um, a lot of it was for the fight and aggression and then when you started to untangle all of the layers of presenting symptoms a lot of it boiled down to love and affection and it almost was related to the mother and so it's not to place the you know like the strain on the mother but when you start to look at the mother's journey in terms of if she's the main breadwinner then because I, I know I, again if this might not sound um, very um, modern but the views of maybe a mother and a father um, if we look at a mother as supposed to be like nurturing and caring and a father as being you know a provider and protector if we look at those traditional roles and then you get a single parent household where maybe the male is less present, then that falls on the woman. So I say it myself, I'm a single parent or a lone parent, whatever term you want to use, um, where actually I've had to then provide and protect and try to nurture. One of those things, I'm juggling too many things, so something has to drop off. And unfortunately, when you've got to put food on your table, the thing that will drop off is the sometimes that loving and nurturing. So you've just been at work, you've had a stressed day dealing with all those micro aggressions, Becky telling you nonsense, giving you grief, do you know what I mean, another manager, then all of the other bits on your journey and whatever's going on, stresses or feels, you come home and maybe you put the key through, the first thing you see is mess. So then you literally almost like... Just lose it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's what you just have to stress all day, you know, especially you're doing it all. Mm. So actually, it would be nice to say, hi guys, how's everybody doing? <laughs> advice would you give to single mothers who are raising boys and and girls and and how they should um what could they do to to support them so for me i um it, i i've got two children um, one is 16 one is six so when i had my 16 year old um a lot of it you know i didn't know when i was just trying out and so my focus at that time was putting food on the table and working so i literally um he went to 
like the nursery from a full day, full day, and I was just out work, just working constantly, trying. And then I got burnt out and didn't, and I noticed that I wasn't present and I wasn't able to connect. Well, by the time I had my second, I decided no, actually, I would rather personally me forfeit some of the finances to be present with my child. So then I went part time, and that's no man's land. So don't even get me started on kind of the issues of working part time. But I thought. I want to be there, and I mean be there with my child, and even if it is at the detriment of finances. And I just thought to myself, well, actually, when they get older, I'd rather it be that, okay, financially, maybe materialistically, they had less, but what they was nurtured in was an abundance and richness of love and just being there. So I know everybody's story is different. Every woman has a different journey, but I do kind of, want to say that it is like you know like making a choice actually you can't sometimes you can't do it all if you can do it all then hats off but actually i feel like the children the nurturing it is about you know like that connection so i would just say one don't beat yourself up don't try and do it all and remember actually that it is about that connection and love with your children and so maybe you might have to forfeit some of the careers or blah 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 to be there that's that's just I understand that. That's actually what I what I decided to do. That was pretty much the route I had taken when I had a sort of career and it was like either spend time at work looking after other people's children or go home and look after my own. It was like, why am I going to be paid to look after someone else's children and I got to go and pay someone else to look after mine. But it is a very it is a very tough decision that people have to make and each to their own, it, you know. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes we're made to feel bad being a mother and that's all but it's like you know like you feel like well I, I'm just but you being a mother is one of the most wonderful roles in the world and even though society might just look down like you've got to do all the things just being a mother is awesome everybody most people have mothers and just that nurturing and teaching you don't know what you're creating and the second thing that I would also say is that if you are a single parent and you don't have like me I don't have any male influences in my um, children's life that's why I got involved in 100 Black Men of London. There's lots of mentoring because I do think it's important for them to be able to have that positive male model. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the father. You've got fathers that are present who are also not positive. So actually, it's, you know, like, it's about choosing someone who they can identify with and also for you to decide what, what do you feel is important in terms of a male role model for your child? It could be about their career. It could be that they, you know, nurturing or a communicator, but something like that. And you will find people out there that they'll be able to connect to. So that's what I yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about the wellness network, uh, the Orange Moon? Is it orangemoon.com? So the Orange Moon well .com, um, so that is like a practitioner's um, network and um, it's quite, it's a holistic network of practitioners. So within that, um, there's therapists, there's um, healers, fitness trainers, nutritionists, and I've just tried to um, create like as I'm going along, meeting people, adding them to directory, you know, so that we can have a network. And so when I do different events, then I will call on these um, people to either promote or, you know, like let us know or offer sometimes their services to the group. So um, at the moment, it's quite small, the actual directory itself. Because before, I had a real big one in the last site. And then I just, I, I still will try to um, expand on it. But in terms of my concierge, I like people who are holistically based and kind of open minded. So that doesn't mean I've met lots of practitioners. And, it, and just because you're a practitioner, it doesn't mean that I will promote you if I don't feel like energetically we're, we're, we're coming from the same thing. <laughs> Another thing that I get um, kind of um, criticised for, I suppose, is um, the fact that it's not exclusively black. So by day people, the majority are black. But again, for me, well-being and wellness is well-being and wellness. So actually, if somebody from somewhere else is offering a service, like I know someone who's a house... Um, a house therapist. I don't know a black house therapist, so I'm not necessarily going to take that house therapist off, you know, like just to, you know, that thing. 
if I can have two, that's good. Do you get what I mean? But if I've got the one and she happens to be outside of my community, then I feel like some people, it's about their wellness. And also, again, it doesn't mean because somebody is black, like I say, with counsellors, just because you meet a black counsellor doesn't mean that you're going to be connected. I think one of the second counsellors um, that I had, she was a black woman, psychotherapist. We had nothing in common, nothing. I couldn't stand her. You know? <laughs> so it, 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 it just, the only shared was the, the, the colour of our skin. Mm. I had a German therapist who we you know, Yeah. So I just want to say, that's the bit that where controversially like other people are like Naomi what's she blah blah what does she stand for so yeah like, it is about for me the wellness and well-being and that's what I'm bringing so that's what I try to do and I do have an event coming up this Thursday on the 17th if I can plug it Thursday 17th which is a well-being wellness practitioners therapists um healers where it's almost just like a party a festivity party for to say thank you what's it called, in people's health and well-being, we're going to play games, have some fun, a bit of networking, um, yeah, and just, I mean, just... That sounds amazing. Network. Yeah, that sounds so good. Do you think in this day and age, like, people should be... I mean, if we're looking at Black Lives Matter and we're looking at all these different um, notions of black people having black people to support them, do you think we should go in there with the mentality of, well, I'm black, so I should only get a black counsellor? Or do you think that's actually going in with the stigma that we're trying to fight against? No, I think it's a positive thing um, because I feel like, um, unfortunately, until it becomes balanced where we can have a choice, we do need to, it's, it's disproportionate at the moment. So I feel like actually we do need more black therapists. We do need people that are understanding. A lot of the, the people that um, come through the counselling who are black, especially um, well, both black men and black women, boys and girls, talk about the fact that they're talking to someone that doesn't look like them, that they can't relate to, that they have to explain. So I do think it's very, very important that we, you know, we have it because it, it you just feel relaxed. You don't need to over-explain things. You can now focus on the therapy as opposed to me trying to get you to understand what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I definitely, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-black, um, so I'm pan-African, so all the way, what I was just saying is that it's, I just don't want people to be the guys that actually, you know, with a black therapist, feeling like energetically they can't connect and they won't go elsewhere because they're like, well, it's black. Do you know what I mean? Mine is just like, just know that people are people. Just like not every black person is your friend, mm -hmm. not every white person is your enemy. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it was more from that. But I do definitely, most of all my research and all the things that I advocate are black by default because that's the only experience that I know. And yeah, that's I, I strongly think it's important and progressive for us. Yeah. What do you think needs to be put in place for the black people of Britain? <laughs> that is a big question, isn't it? <laughs> if you could give me five things, give me five, your top five things that could be put in place. Um, I think for me, support, 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 support. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I would say that five, five support in every way. So I think... Gosh, the excitement now. So, um, yes, yeah, so support um, one with um, our mental health, our mental well-being. But when I say support, it isn't about um, having services that are kind of white with a black face. Mm -hmm. It's actually having black um, African-centered, black-led um, services for us, by us, um, that type of thing. Um, not just with our mental health. I would say in all of our health and well-being. Then I would go on to say in terms of schools, um, um, a lot more included in the curriculum on, um, you know, like black African-centered history positively, as opposed to just having one month of black history, just having um, the slave narrative. I feel like a lot more in terms of that, in terms of schooling. I think in the workplace, we have seen a lot of um, initiatives now where, you know, all this black lives matter, so then all of a sudden workplaces are like, we're inclusive, we're inclusive, we've got a little thing. But what they've done is that they've then put the pressure on their black employees now to fulfil the quota, like as if they haven't got their already their everyday job to do. So yeah. Actually make them more work. They feel that it's like, you know, any black issues, they don't feel <laughs> Mm -hmm. that actually isn't right. And if it's a central 
central service, something like that, where you know you can go through and they can do it on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like work with school, and then like I said, more in terms of um, I feel like from an NHS and a policy um, kind of level, more services and research into us again, led by us. But um, so somebody I know and I just spoke to um, today is trying to set up a black support crisis line. So just all of that trying to do it and having maybe the opportunity to have the access to funding rather than all the red tape that we feel like we've got to jump around to try to get um, our services. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely feel support. And in terms of um, the judicial system, are people still coming to you feeling like there's this uh, stigma that comes along with their sentencing and things that are going on in the court system? Oh, most definitely. Um, so I think Cheryl Phoenix, she's a big one on the, has, I think the pipeline, the, the school to prison pipeline, she calls mm -hmm. it. Um, and yeah, the, it is. There's definitely the, the in fact that should be one, another one of the, the top one is that judicial system because it is it's as we've seen that from even just a reminder from small acts that we still we've come far but we've still got a long way to go and it's disproportionate and it's systematically racist and we know this what we've seen already in the US what we know over here but there's also that feeling of we see it we know it but nothing's being done, mm -hmm. frustration of well, where can we go? Mm -hmm. So again, um, there definitely needs to be, I suppose, a lot more black people higher up um, in the decision-making process. We seem to be quite heavy in the, 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 the grassroots or on the ground, but actually we need more in the policy. And it isn't just one or two where they feel the pressure. Actually, we need a lot more to be able to, do you know what I mean, advice on our behalf. So the judicial, that's a whole reform in itself, mm -hmm. um, seriously, in terms of our everyday experience. And if there are people that are dealing with any issues, are there any places that they can be directed to at this point? Are there systems in place that can help these kind of cases? So on my website, um, there's a section for wellness um, and wellbeing directory, and that's split into different categories to help people. So some people come to me and say, I'm looking for a male um, you know, section, or I'm looking for women, so I'm looking for black. And then they've got a category that they can go specifically in, um, and they're listed there, as well as having um, supporting organisations. So every time I come across an organisation, whether that's youth, for fathers, for women, I just add that there. And so I'm hoping that once that gets populated, that will also have a subcategory. So there's lots of um, directories out there. So I'm not saying that um, mine is the only one um, in terms of wellness. But what, um, I don't have a problem with putting other people's directories in mine. So mine's not exclusive like that. So anything that's signpost, I'm a signposter. So I get a lot of... Um, people asking me for, you know, like, oh, do you know this such and such, or do you have, because I'm in like an African therapist network, I'm in Black Bruce, as well as that, I'm also part of um, um, the Wellness Action Alliance, which is a parenting support group, so there, there's another directory, and I also manage that one on that behalf, um, where it's all about parent links for young people, for children, education, mentoring, so again, I kind of, I'm one of those people that see things on top line, so I'm your first it would be very rare if I don't know where you can go or what you can do or what, you know, to, to sign place. So I think a lot of the time it's about people not knowing where to go. And we're doing really amazing things in our community. There's so many great people doing amazing things. Like just this Saturday, I was on a um, an event called the Queen's, I think it's um, the Queen's Walking Group, um, a lady called Joan, and she just had done a youth one. So there was about five different youth organizations 100 black men of london urban synergy and it was talking about all the great things they do we've got manhood we've got you know like so it's just about sometimes people knowing where it is to go so yeah i'm the first point you can send me an email you can go my directory i definitely think that's so important because i think there is this stigma that there's nothing for black people there's nothing around and no one's doing anything but actually that's not the case and you are like living proof that there are so many resources and systems and people that do care and want to see uh, black people rise again. So thank you so much. What are your plans for um, what are your plans for 2021 now? So for 2021, um, I, it's because for me, unfortunately, um, well not unfortunately really, but fortunately, it was quite a good year for me to find out what 
work, I love working from home. I can't I tell you. For me, again, a woman, <laughs> a single pet, mother, it's really worked out for me. Um, so now it's, it, it allows me the time to look at the service that I'm offering. So I was a little bit more splintered everywhere, doing many things, and it wasn't ordered. So next year, I will be much more targeted. So I've got lots of um, workshops coming up and trainings and programs. So that's what I'll be delivering. So I'll be delivering it on both sides. So I've got my own personal blog, which is the uh, more um, yoni.com. And so that one um, is more about personal development and more intimate and more kind of women focused. Whereas the Orange Moon stuff is around more wellness and bringing practitioners in and bringing their stuff. So I've got lots of things um, coming up. So yeah, I'm really looking, I'm really looking forward to um, next year because I'm going to be working a lot more easier and a lot more smartly. And can you tell us a little bit more about the Queen's Project UK? Yeah, so the Queen's Project UK, so um, that um, is supported by this girl can. And so basically when we was offline, uh, my background is Muay Thai, um, and so we set up, I used to teach women in the mosque mainly, that was my main way, women in the mosque, because they always wanted to, obviously, like a women coach, and so I taught them in the mosque, and then we, we used to do kickboxing, a little bit of Muay Thai, the elbows and knees, the, the girl's best friend, because women were in close contact, so then we set up a project which was kind of kickboxing and self-defense to kind of enable the women to release stress and because I think that's my background so I train to release stress fitness is a bonus but it's more about like oh, so people would come in and by the end um, so what we used to do is get them to check in their emotions um, so trying to link that kind of fitness and mental well-being and then at the end of the class they would check out with their emotions um, we always also used to have a principle of the month um, so something so this month December is giving um, I think the last month was um, beginner's mindset. So something that we meditate on and try to each week think about how we can move towards that. So trying to bring that spiritual element in to make it holistic. Everything I do is kind of holistic. And as well as um, supporting some of the mums with their businesses, so then we would try to do, um, I think it was every third Sunday, um, showcase of your business. You know, they might make bags. Cakes, you know, like that type of thing, so supporting the mum and nurse, as well as giving them links as well. So it was just trying to, and so our hashtag is what's your fight? So it's about women that are fighting for things. So if it's fighting for equality, peace, freedom, space, every woman or mother that knows usually has some fight and struggle. And I think it comes again from my own story of fighting for support, fighting for the right to be fighting for so many things that it's just like a place where other women can feel inspired by other women's stories. So I also um, do um, mum combo, so it's um, no filtered mum combo. And what's really been beautiful about that is I didn't realise how much women and mothers have to say and how much just hearing their story can inspire you also about some of the things maybe that they don't do so well providing tips and just inspiration so yeah oh Naomi you have been such an inspiration to me just to me alone today so god knows how many people you're going to have touched today with your stories thank you so much for joining us and I will definitely see you soon I'm going to be on your page like straight away after this like <laughs> getting some tips and tricks thank you so much for joining us and we will see you soon you can check out Naomi at Naomi Orange Moon on Instagram follow her and do support her in any way that you can if you do have any questions, you can DM at her and we will try and put you in touch with people who can support you no matter what your situation.